Right. We'd like to welcome you into this conversation as we are kicking off our health and wellness campaign with the Walk for the Cure. And we are really uh, excited about the opportunity to be able to raise awareness, particularly in the area of making people understand the condition of sickle cell anemia. We're here now with Tessa Allen. Tessa, Hi. thank you so much for participating with us. Tessa is going to be involved with the opportunity that we're taking advantage of and making people know that common people, everyday people, mm -hmm. people that are part of our lifestyles have uh, been able to survive and function very adequately uh, with sickle cell anemia. But then there is still a large population that has no clue that they have it. And we are really encouraging everyone to get tested and to ensure yourself that if you do, then you can begin to get treatment. Because treatment is really important. Treatment is very important, yes. The challenges that uh, we understand about this particular area of health in relationship to how individuals can go living without knowing that they have it mm -hmm. is really important. You, you have had it for a number of years. How did you find out that you had sickle cell anemia? Well, first of all, sickle cell anemia is something that you're born with. Really? Yes. It's carried down from each parent has one of the genes, and one in four of, your, of their children inherit, actually get sickle cell disease. So I've had sickle cell disease all my life and um, didn't know I had it. As a matter of fact, when I was two, I was diagnosed as, ha as having um, polio. Really? Yes, because they didn't know why I wasn't walking when I used to walk. Uh, they didn't know why I was in so much pain. Um, and at that time, there was this outbreak of polio. So they diagnosed me as having polio. So it wasn't until I was about 30 that I was actually diagnosed with sickle cell disease. And this was after I had had three children. When the diagnosis was erroneously made, and I guess obviously there were medications that you had to receive. I don't remember. Okay. Because I was too I was two years old. How did I, how did effectively uh, you get the proper treatment? I didn't receive the proper treatment until I was actually diagnosed, and the only treatment um, is pain meds. Um, you have to stay hydrated. So you're always in the hospital. Um, it, are you, that was at that time, though. You, you was always in the hospital? I was Even always now? in, you, you're always in the hospital. Really? It's because mm -hmm. it, the, the, the change in the seasons affect sickle cell patients. I'm fortunate that I have what's called SC disease. It's the less serious form of the disease. Uh, the more serious is SS. Okay. And those are people you'll find that they're very skinny, but and, and oftentimes when I go to the hospital to the emergency room, they look at me like, "Are you sure you have sickle cell? Mm -hmm. You look heavy for a sickle cell patient." So oftentimes, um, nurses especially think I'm just coming in there to get drugs, because that's the only treatment is the pain meds that they give you and it's heavy duty drugs. So in in most cases, an individual. Uh who probably has it, would be interactively trying to overcome that particular that pain. Yes. yes. And they would constantly be probably getting over-the-counter medications, thinking that that is their remedy. Over-the-counter medication does not help. Really? It does not help. It's very intense pain. It's almost like being in childbirth. Um, if whenever I'm in pain and my family's there to help to get me to the hospital, if I'm being transported by car, they can't touch me because the pain is so intense. The slightest touch, it, it really affects me. So I have to literally carry myself to the car and then get myself up and into a wheelchair to be pushed into the emergency room because it's very intense pain. And depending on where what we call crisis, when these crises happen, depending on where it happens. It could be my legs, it could be my arms. Um, I sometimes have, I've only had it twice 
and I have been told I was fortunate as that I've only had it twice is the chest syndrome um, which it can go really bad you can you can pass from that from that type of crisis so for all my life I've been on going through crises all the time not knowing what was wrong with me until 30 and this is something that's going to be ongoing are there any types of remedies in relationship to keeping uh, the, I guess, the traumatic part of the disease from affecting you on an ongoing basis? No. No. I, I think they're, they're trying to, I think they're trying to come up with a cure for the disease and it will be more helpful to infants. They can do a blood transfusion and there's a lot of different stem cell research that's going on right now. But for me, because I'm, I'm much older, the only thing that helps is I have to always ensure, especially in the summer, that I stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. I have to be careful that I don't stress myself out too much. I have to be careful that um, whenever I get a cold, uh, that's why it's so important that people with sickle cell disease get uh, the vaccines, the yearly vaccines, flu vaccines. Um, uh, what's the other vaccine? Um, pneumonia vaccines. It's very important that we get that so that we don't catch colds that then triggers, could then trigger a crisis. Thinking about the, um, the importance of knowing that those conditions do occur, the attitude that we have in terms of raising awareness about sickle cell anemia is beginning to take a, a lot of attention. And uh, in particular, as Tessa has just shared with us, many people are, are not willing to talk about the situation because it's so traumatic and certainly it's painstaking in relationship to when to know how to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess um, there is also a withdrawal knowing that there's very little that is being done to help it. But when you talk about cure for it, um, in, in relationship to some of the ways in which they have tried to, you know, remedy the chronic pain, uh, blood transfusions are predominantly used when individuals have like low blood counts Correct. or limited uh, red blood cells. Correct. The, the sickle cell is supposed to be, it takes over the, Correct. the white blood cells, take over the red blood. Can you Correct. share with me exactly? Um, well, I've had several blood transfusions, and the first I had is when I was actually diagnosed. So my blood count was dropping very, very quickly. And I was diagnosed at a time when um, AIDS, we were just be, being made aware of the HIV AIDS. So I was very reluctant to get a blood transfusion. Uh, in any event, the doctor stood their ground, and eventually, um, when I could no longer pick my head up off the pillow, off the bed, I decided, okay, I'll go ahead and get the blood transfusion. So I've had that. I've had several since. And that's the only thing that kind of helps counteract the crisis. It brings you back to a, a healthier you faster than if you did not get a blood transfusion. So you would have to either take your chances, and if your blood count drops so much that you can't get back, to being healthy, to being alive. That's the only, that's the only treatment mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. That's the only way I could have been, I could be helped. Well, it's interesting you say for me, every case isn't the same. I'm not sure if every case is, is the same or not. Um, I just know that for me, a lot of times um, I'm able, fortunately, I'm able to just get the pain meds I'm in the hospital for about a week. If it's a very, if it's a really bad crisis, I'll, I'm in the hospital for about two weeks. So I've been fortunate that I've only been, I've only had to have the pain meds most times than the blood transfusion. Have you ever been involved with advocating for awareness? I haven't been, only because I see it as a stigma and hmm. because it affects, jobs don't want to say this, but it affects 
your ability to maintain a job, I think. Especially if you have um, SS disease, when you're more prone to uh, more attacks, more crises. You're out of work a lot when you, when you have these crises. So the longest I've been out of work with a crisis is two months. Hmm. And when employers see that, they don't want to hire you. They want to keep you. They don't want to hire you. So it's like a stigma. So I haven't been very vocal about it. Okay. And then understanding that because you have to be protective. Yes. And even in relationship to knowing that uh, almost cases when individuals are being alienated in a sense of simply because of their uh, situation in life, it, it becomes a burden. And one of the things that I really want to ask you also is the similarities when you say you need a blood transfusion, it sounds like almost like dialysis. I've never had dialysis, so I'm not sure okay. what the dialysis, dialysis treatments consist of. Um, Just the cleansing. It, it's like, you know. It, okay. In mm -hmm. that sense, it's kind of like dialysis because they're giving you blood to help replace some of the, um, the cells that are being eaten up. Mm -hmm. They're putting good cells back into your body. So if the body grabs a hold of that, you know, it cleanses everything that the crises, the, the sickle cell disease is actually eating up all the good, um, all the um, white cells, mm -hmm. white cells. So it, it's like a cleansing. It replaces what's being taken out of you. I see. Well, you know, what's so important about uh, this conversation, I'm very happy that you're brave enough to discuss it with Thank us you. and share with us why it's going to be so important when we do have the Sickle Cell Walk for the Cure uh, awareness uh, activity on September 22nd that we will have the Blood Center of New Jersey mm. out uh, doing um, blood drive. And because we, we can really see how important it is for an individual such as Tessa who needs to have this life sustaining, yes. you know, uh, type of uh, part of their lifestyle and why it's so important for us to get involved. You know, it's not a lot that you would have to give to help somebody live and to have somebody have a decent life to live because as you do these things, it, it, it does eliminate the long periods of time. Exactly. And then, therefore, those types of restrictions that especially employers have mm -hmm. are limited. Yes. So, therefore, we're doing what we can to continue to ensure and do what we can understand is the most important way to help share our lives with others. When you think about the support that's being given for sickle cell in relationship to making people aware and understand it, do you think that type of uh, effect will help the future of an opportunity for a cure to exist? I think so. And the more awareness um, that there is out there, the better I think it will be for our youth. And I think the more understanding of the disease that that's out there, the more awareness that's out there, it gives a better, it gives people like me, the, the younger generation, the people who will possibly get the disease, um, it gives them a better chance, mm -hmm. you know, of not just of life, but to be free to say, you know, oh, you know, I have sickle cell disease or I have a sickle cell trait without that fear of, oh, if they find out, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hold this job for much longer. And in addition to that, there's also, um, I sometimes feel this burden that I'm placing on my family mm -hmm. because every time I get sick, it's, can somebody come get me, please? I can't, you know, and most times it's three hours in the morning. And it just, it, it makes you feel, oh, God, here I go again. I'm, I'm asking them to do this for me again. I'm asking them to do this for me. I'm putting them out. You know, so it, it, it would kind of relieve some of that burden, both the, the personal, with the family, and with the jobs. Because the more awareness, the, the faster we come up with a cure, I think it will be better for generations to come. Well, as you look, you know, it's very important as we will continue to advocate and find ways in relationship to raise funds that will give us an opportunity to build the kind of relationships that are necessary, especially now that we know that uh, one of the programs that has been effectively provided for sickle cell awareness is, is being, um, um, I guess, uh, money is not mm. given as much as it was in the past. 
and we're going to be fighting to advocate uh, on Capitol Hill to the federal, federal legislators to increase the resources for people with sickle cell anemia and to help initiate a program to support young people with sickle cell disease to transition from pediatric to adult care. Um, we certainly are happy that you're helping us to educate and inspire the community through this particular presentation and you're going to be working with us um, in the future yes so that we can be able to have different outreach activities and uh, provide awareness for people to understand how important it is to get actively involved and and to share your life for others so come on out on September the 22nd with the walk for the cure we're going to be providing all kinds of information and a number of different ways in which we can be able to build a strong relationship in regard to making people understand the many different issues that are involved in our community when it comes to health and wellness. Tessa, we'd like to thank you very much. Thank and you. uh, we'll be looking forward to working with you in the future. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you for tuning in.